Hi guys, my name is Angela and welcome back to my YouTube channel. It is the end of August, which means it is the end of winter. It has been a good month. It has been a good month in books. It has been a good month personally. And today I'm going to share with you a highlight from my month and also go through the books that I read for the month of August. Like I said, it was a good reading month and I can't wait to share these books with you. Last weekend, my mum and I actually went to a production of the play of Death of a Salesman from Arthur Miller, which was absolutely wonderful. I had never seen the play before. I knew a little bit about the content, but I had never read the play. I did manage to track down a copy of the play itself. I got this little copy in a uh, secondhand bookstore. This is not Arthur Miller. This was an actor who played Willie Loman in one of the productions. Arthur Miller was someone who came to my attention because of my love of Marilyn Monroe. And I think I always wanted to kind of understand was he really this incredible playwright? Like he was so blown up at that time, right, in the 50s. And I really wanted to understand was he as amazing as he was. And so I was, when I saw that the advertisements for the production coming to Perth, I messaged my mum and I was like, do you want to come with me? And she was like, of course. So she is my theatre buddy. And so we went to the play last weekend and it was fantastic. The cast and the production was so, so well done. The leads of Willie and Linda Lohman were Anthony, Anthony LaPaglia and Alison White, and Alison White in particular as Linda Lohman was just incredible. Her performance was amazing. But the standout for me was Biff, who was played by Josh Hellman, who is quite a popular he is quite a well-known Australian actor like he's done a number of movies I think he's in the latest like the upcoming Furiosa Mad Max movie but his portrayal of Biff was just heartbreaking at times and it was so so well done I really really enjoyed it the what I found interesting about the play was that this play was written in 19 well I mean it was written in 1949 which is four years after World War II and the content was still so relevant from today's perspective, which I found so interesting. Like, you know, you would think surely the concerns of 1949 parents and children and, and so on would have been a little bit different, but they were exactly the same. It was really, I mean, yeah, it was really interesting to see it from, to think about it from that perspective. And the content just really holds up today. I read that Arthur Miller wrote Act 1 in less than one day and then he finished the rest of the play in about a six-week period which was kind of incredible and then he went on to win so many awards and Tonys and the Pulitzer for drama. It was so powerful, so relevant, such a must-watch for fathers and sons and mothers and everyone. I think it, it really is incredible if you ever have the opportunity to see a production of Death of a Salesman go see it for sure. I had to laugh when the concession stand had some little junior mints. They had like a number of American uh, confectionery or lollies. Like there was junior mints, there was milk duds, Twizzlers, Reese's Pieces, things like that, which you, we're seeing more and more of that sort of stuff now on the shelves here, like Hershey's and stuff, but I don't often see junior mints. For the record, Reese's Pieces or Reese's are my favorite chocolate but Junior Mints I've never had before. So I decided to get them and it shows you how little I've had them. I opened them wrong. Like I opened them from the back and there's apparently like an actual like open close. So I had some Junior Mints, which might've been just a bit of a gimmick because we were watching what is considered to be the best American play of the 20th century. So that might've been what it was. But anyway, that was a definite highlight of my month, but let's get into what I read in August. The first one I read was Agatha Christie by Lucy Worsley. Now, in my last wrap-up video for July, I told you I was reading this book and I had planned to finish this book, but I promptly put it down because there was a, a, a chapter I started reading about the murder of Roger Ackroyd. And so I put this book down and I didn't want any spoilers and I went and picked up Roger Ackroyd and read that. Good which meant I didn't finish this book like I thought I was going to. So I then picked up this one again and finished this one. I really enjoyed this book. Lucy Worsley is a great writer. She, I, I knew her from documentaries, from watching her talk about the Tudors or Jane Austen. She is really, really great. She has such a great conversational tone and she puts things in language that is very easy to understand and, and makes you want to keep watching and listening. And her writing is no different to how she talks. It's quite a chatty tone when you read it. 
So this book was published in 2022 and it is a biography of Agatha Christie's life. It starts off with a little bit about Agatha Christie's parents, their individual lives growing up, and then, of course, Agatha Christie's childhood, her adolescence, her coming out, her her efforts in the war, her volunteering in the in the you know the the war, her first marriage, her writing, her second marriage, you know, all that sort of stuff. Everything that you want to know is in there, her disappearance, all that kind of stuff. It is so well done. Um I I really did think that it was I didn't leave having read this book wishing that I had heard something else. I have read biographies at times thinking, oh I there was I wish that had been covered a little bit more. I didn't leave wishing that. I felt like everything was covered very well and very respectfully, especially around her disappearance, which was such, unfortunately, it seems to be such a big piece of her life now that people want to talk about is this 11 or 12 days that she just disappeared uh, and no one knew where she was or what had happened to her. And then she just, you know, was found. And anyway, I I really enjoyed this particular book and in particular the information around her writing. Something that I got out of this was the fact that a lot of her friends didn't understand when she wrote because something Agatha Christie didn't have was a dedicated writing space. She wrote where she could. She wrote at a you know, a small desk in her room that like everybody would have had a writing desk or she wrote from the dining table or wherever. And a lot of people said that they never saw her write and yet she was churning out these books consistently and i think what a lot of uh, what something in the in the book uh, discussed was that she would just write a book put it out live off the proceeds and then write another book you know so in in late summer autumn she would uh, write a book it would be published at christmas she'd live off the proceeds and then repeat that cycle and i kind of found it funny that she's a little bit like you know, an Emily Henry or a Taylor Jenkins Reid who published a book every year. That's what Agatha Christie was doing. And and yet everyone was just lapping it up. They would always get a Christie for Christmas, which is what they called it. I found that quite interesting. And it was only later in life where she actually had a dedicated room to doing her craft. She was so prolific, so many, so many books that she had written. And it was it was interesting when Lucy Worsley, she obviously has read Christie's entire back catalogue because she would talk about how certain characters would come up and they would be um, elements of that character that would relate back to a person in Agatha Christie's real life. So she really had done her research. It is, I think it's a must read for anyone who loves books. And I particularly loved all of the, just the imagery around Agatha Christie, just like you know, actually cruising down the Nile and going on holidays to Egypt. And I mean, I just, I really love that imagery and that was her life. And so I, I did enjoy it. If you love books, not necessarily Agatha Christie, I do recommend it. It was, it's a particular snapshot of a time in history. It was really, really great. And Agatha Christie had an incredibly rich life. Really, really great book. The next book I read was My Cousin Rachel by Daphne du Maurier and I loved this book. I am not going to go into a big spiel about this because I did an entire video about this book. So I'm going to share a link in the description below and at the end of this video so you can go and you can have a look at this. Uh, you can, you know, find that. I loved it. I recommend it and go watch that video. The next book I read was Bambi by Felix Sultan. This is part of my children's classics project that I've had ongoing since maybe March, I think. And Bambi was something I wanted to hold off until winter to read, which I did and I have read it. And I was quite stunned by this book. I really, I don't know what I expected, but it wasn't what I got. I was captivated by the nature writing in this. It is not written from a perspective of like, it's not dumbed down for a child at all. The, the way it's written is very simple and the prose is beautiful, but it's still quite, the beauty that he talks about is so heartwarming. The sorrow is heartbreaking. It's really, really well done. And my understanding is that Felix Sultan was a poet. Um, first and foremost, he was an Austrian author. I really did enjoy it. The, 
the pu- the prose was just beautiful. It was published in 1923, and of course, you probably know it from the Disney adaptation. I have not watched the Disney adaptation for a long time, so I cannot give you a really great comparison. So let's just kind of start from the beginning of what this book is about. So the story opens with Bambi and his mother. Uh, Bambi has just been born in spring and he's, you know, just admiring all of the beauty in the world. He's got his friends, the squirrel and the screech owl and the hare, and he and his mother are just living this beautiful life. And eventually he realizes that life is not as sublime as it is in those first few moments of his pure innocence of having been born. It it was really quite funny when he was first born and as a baby where he'd be asking his mum all these questions that toddlers ask, you know, why is the sky blue? Why does this happen? And his mother's answering questions just like a toddler asks us questions. I thought that was really funny. But eventually, you know, spring ends, you know, they go through summer and eventually autumn comes and the season changes and winter comes and Bambi goes through his first real hardships where he's having to find food and struggle a little bit. And then he encounters man and he realizes that there is some danger in life. I really wish I had read this before I responded to the nature tag video, which I'll I'll link again below because I think this probably would have made it into that list of books. This is an incredible book if you want a glimpse into the natural world. I think it really is an an amazing book in that sense. And I don't know where I read it. It might have been in the introduction. Yeah, in in the introduction. I don't know who this guy is, John Goldsworthy. But he said he recommends it to all sportsmen. So people who hunt, he recommends this book to. And I think it is really, uh, that's an interesting thing because there is that element of man coming in and hunting the, you know, rabbits and deer. Anyway, it has some great messages in here. And I, th- I think it is a really good book for adults and children, not children, children, but, you know, older children. Writing is really wonderful and um, very thoughtful and very, it was very surprising. So if you haven't read it yet or haven't, haven't read it before, I would, I would recommend that you give it a go. It is beautiful. The next book I read was Clear by Karis Davies. Picking up this book, I'm trying, I was trying to think of a way of how I felt picking up this book and every time I picked this up it was akin to that moment when you would pick up a shell and you would put it to your ear and you would just hear like that whoosh of the ocean and I felt that with this book. There was something in it that just I don't know what something happened and it is a very small novella it was the first book I've read of Karis Davies and I know a number of you are excited to read her books um, if you have a number of you have got them on your reading lists and I will most definitely be picking up some other ones of hers she I thought her books might have been a little bit more similar to Claire Keegan's I think her writing style is very different although she does have that same brevity that Claire Keegan has that they she can really get a lot into a sentence that just sits with you. Um, I really did enjoy her writing style. But the story from Clear, it kind of starts with two historical facts. The great disruption of the Scottish church, which happened in 1843. And then there was something else called the clearances. The great disruption was essentially giving landowners uh, power and ownership over the clergy which gave them much too much license and ministers rebelled against this and established their own free church as an alternative. And then the clearances was a program that allowed landowners to forcibly remove people, generally the poor uh, in the highlands or the islands of Scotland, and they would move, they would forcibly remove whole communities, which led to um, starvation, uh, extreme labour, displacement, enforced migration. So these were two historical things that did happen and that kind of forms the basis of this book. So with those two things, we then get introduced to three characters essentially. There is John who is a rebel minister who is appointed by a landowner to evict a man off a, an island and it's a, fi- it's a fictitious island in this book. And so he's been given this job to do and he kind of has this moral dilemma. He's like, this is not a, it's not a nice thing to do, but he needs the money to start his own church, the free church. 
and to support his wife, who is the another character. After he makes it to the island, he is injured and he is unconscious, and he is found by Ivar, who is the inhabitant of the island. And Ivar finds him, he nurses him back to health, and they eventually John regains consciousness, but they can't communicate because Ivar speaks an ancient language called, I think it's called Norm, It's interesting, in the back of the book, there's actually like a little glossary of the words of what Ivar speaks, and John speaks like a traditional Scottish language, what we would probably call, I guess, English today. And so they can't speak, they can't communicate with words, but they find other ways to communicate, and John starts to learn Ivar's language as he's recuperating from his injuries. They they, they start to form a friendship all the while John knows that he's there to to evict Ivar off this island, this only life that Ivar has known. To be honest, the ending of the story was quite a, it was a surprise for me. I did not see it coming and I think I will reread the book in the future and I'll probably pick up a few other things that I didn't see the first time around, even for such a small book. There are things in here I think that are hidden that I will see the next time around. The the back of the book has quite a lot of information around the, the historical facts as well as an entire glossary, like I said, around the Norn, Norn origins of the language that um, Karis Davies used for the language of Ivar. So I thought it was really great. I thought it was a really beautiful little novella and I will pick it up again in the future and I'm looking forward to picking up some more of her work. And the last book I read this in August was The Palace by Gareth Russell and I am not going to lie, I came for the cover art but I stayed for the story. I am an Anglophile. I know a ridiculous amount of garbage about the Tudors and the royal family and the monarchs and all that sort of stuff. And it's it's just a subject that has fascinated me for such a long time. And I don't I don't know why. It probably started when my parents took me to see like the Tower of London, all that sort of stuff when I was a kid. And that's probably where it started from, getting all that history. But this book was really, really great. So the premise of this book is it's written from the location of Hampton Court. So Hampton Court was a house or a call it house, I guess it was a mansion, a court owned by Cardinal Wolsey, who was a minister for King Henry VIII. When Cardinal Wolsey had his downfall, the court went into the ownership of King Henry VIII, who then turned into one of his residences and he took a, undertook a number of upgrades and renovations to turn it into one of his primary residences. He really loved it. It was outside of London. It was more of like a getaway kind of place. It was not in the centre of London, so it was far enough away, I think, that they felt like they were getting away from it all. But anyway, what I really loved about this was it gave you enough information about things that you knew while still giving you information about things that I had no idea about, people I didn't know about. The walls of this place have saw so many things. They saw the downfall of Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, the commissioning of the King James Bible. It was a hiding place for many, many of King Charles II's mistresses. It was the location for the coronation ball of Queen Elizabeth II. And the book takes us through the history of Hampton Court through the four houses of the monarch. So there is, it starts off with the Tudors and then it goes into the Stuarts and then it goes through the Hanovers and the Windsors. And I, there was there was quite a bit of humour in here, I thought. It was really well done. But instead of just focusing on King Henry VIII and William III and George II, it kind of takes a story from people that you have no idea about in history, which made it more interesting. I particularly was taken aback, and I, I think one of my most favourite stories in here was something about the unknown warrior which at face value has nothing to do with Hampton Court because the one unknown warrior tomb is at Westminster Abbey. But it was apparently at the suggestion of King George V that a, an ancient oak on the Hampton Court estate was to be used to create the coffin for the unknown warrior, which, I mean, it's just a teeny tiny little bit of information which then led to this entire other story which I found so fascinating, which I want to share with you. They've buried the unknown warrior, they have had the funeral for the unknown warrior, and the Duke of York, who eventually becomes King George VI, is about to marry Lady Elizabeth Bowles-Lyon, who will become uh, 
Queen, who was Queen Elizabeth II's mother. And this is what happened in Westminster Abbey. Outside the Abbey, rain fell on the crowds who had gathered to watch the first public wedding of a British prince since the 16th century, as the House of Windsor tentatively embraced the age of mass media. The Duke's 22-year-old bride, Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, arrived on the arm of her Scottish father Claude, Earl of Strathmore and Kinghorn, through the Abbey's western door where they were met by several members of the clergy who would escort them in procession to the altar. One of the clergymen fainted as the procession began and as they waited for him to be helped to the service to recommence. Elizabeth's eyes travelled up the nave where she caught sight of the tomb of the unknown warrior. Letting go of Claude's arm, she impulsively went over to the grave on which she laid her bridal bouquet of roses and lily of the valley. The organ then began to play as the wedding procession regrouped. This gesture on the part of Elizabeth, who was Queen Consort from 1936 to 1952 and Queen Mother from 1952 to 2002, became famous, although it is often misreported with the detail that she respectfully set the flowers on the grave as she and her husband left the Abbey. And then it goes on to say that um, most people agree that it was impulsive because four of Elizabeth's brothers had served on the Western Front and one of them, Fergus, had fallen at age 26 during the Battle of Lewes. Some guests at the wedding felt that as she waited with her father at the Abbey door, Elizabeth's mind had turned to Fergus, prompting her to set her flowers on the grave. Her parents' castle at Glamis in Scotland had been turned into a military convalescent home during the war, through which a teenage Elizabeth had seen many men come to be cured and then go back to a war from which they were not lucky enough to return a second time. Maybe it was one of them in the grave. That was the point, as far as Elizabeth was concerned. Whoever rested there might be one of their family, friends, guests or neighbours. It was equally likely to be a son, nephew, brother, father, uncle, cousin, lover, husband or friend of those who cut down the tree at Hampton Court to make his coffin or of the carpenters who fashioned it. It might be Major Fitzsimon's brother Jack or a former comrade of the Navy personnel who helped bring the coffin back across the channel. In being nobody, the unknown warrior could be everybody's. I just, it's not, it's not a, like... That Those are the sort of stories that were in here, and I really do recommend it. If you have any interest in the uh, royal family, in British history, I highly recommend this book. I think it was so well-researched, so well-written, very easy to read. I really did enjoy it. So thank you so much for joining me for this August wrap-up. It was a good month. I had a good month of reading. Don't forget to check the link at the end for the video to my cousin Rachel thoughts. And I look forward to seeing you soon. I'm going to be sharing my spring reading plan with you very shortly. So be sure to check that out. But in the meantime, have a wonderful reading weekend ahead and I will talk to you soon. Bye.